All right. Let's continue our conversation about Stoicism, going over the Moral Letters by Lucius Aeneas Seneca. This is letter 66, and it's very long. It... Oh. Team, elf, 11 pages. Um... I'm obviously not going to read you all that, because that would be a long, long read. The context of Letter 66 is that Seneca says he has just seen Claranus, uh, who was a fellow student, and given that Seneca is now an older man, so is Claranus, um, and he um, uh, apparently has... his body has broken down largely, he suffered from age-related issues, but his mind is very clear still, so... Seneca describes in great detail, pages and pages of detail, uh, all the conversations he has had with his friend Claranus. And in my mind, I, I'm, I'm really cherry-picking here because there is so much in this letter. Uh, what I found most interesting is two slightly longer paragraphs, but I wanted to read them to you in their entirety, and then we can discuss them. Okay. He says, what then is reason, the imitation of nature? What is the highest good of the human being, behaving as nature intended? This is one of the core principles of Stoicism. Go along with the universe, don't go against it because you will suffer. If you can go along whatever happens on your path, you'll be okay. If you try to go against it, you're probably going to suffer more and more. So, do that. Okay. There can be doubt... Excuse me, there can be no doubt that peace that never meets with strife is more fortunate than peace regained through much bloodshed. Bloodshed, sorry. There can be no doubt that undisturbed health is a more fortunate thing than health achieved by main force and endurance out of serious and life threatening illnesses. In the same way, there can be no doubt that joy is a greater good than a mind shored up to endure the torments of injury and the flame. No. For those chance occurrences admit of tremendous differentiation. They are evaluated by the usefulness of those who take them on. One of the goods is a determination to be in agreement with nature. This is equal in all of them. When we vote in favor of someone in the Senate, it cannot be said that one senator was more in agreement than another. Everyone voted the same way. I say the same about the virtues. All of them are in agreement with nature. And I say the same about goods. All of them are in accordance with nature. One person dies in his youth, another in old age, another right away in infancy, after having only a glimpse of life. All of them were equally mortal, even if death allowed some people's lives to last longer, cut off others in their bloom, and interrupted the very beginning of others. One man collapses at dinner, another dies as a continuation of sleep, another is done in by sexual intercourse. Compare with these the people who are run through by the sword, or killed by snake bite, or crushed by collapsing buildings, or tortured slowly to death by the gradual twisting and contracting of their sinews. Some of these can be said to have had a better ending, some are worse, but their deaths, in point of fact, are equal. What they have been through is different. What they have come to is one. No death is larger or smaller for it has the same limit in every case, the end of a life. I say the same to you about goods. This good is among unmitigated pleasures, that one amid bitter trials. The one has fortune's lavishness to govern, the other's fortune's violence to subdue. And both are equally good, though one has walked a soft and level way, the other a rocky road. For all of them have the same end, they are goods, They are praiseworthy. They are the companions of virtue and reason. Virtue counts as equal all things it recognizes as good. I find him very poetic here. He says a couple of things that are very, very poetic, very, very beautifully put. Okay. I think there are some things uh, to be said here. First, talking about... um, virtue. So, 
It's good. I, I think it's good. I've said this in the past a couple of times because this is a very important aspect of Stoicism, but I think it's good once in a while to, to remind ourselves of this. Stoic ethics, where ethics is not used in the context as it is today, it's not about, about what is morally acceptable, it's not morally acceptable, uh, which is a simplification of ethics, but I think you know what I mean, like is it the kind of things like, is abortion acceptable, yes or no, etc. These kinds of questions, right? Stoic ethics, uh, in, in the, the classical philosophical sense of the word ethics, is just a matter of trying to figure out how to lead a good life. How to do well, how to lead that that life of evdemonia, the rich and fulfilling life, a positive life, a pleasant life, a life free from, as free as possible from frustrations, anger, those kinds of things, the bad passions, the Stoics would write, except they wouldn't say it in English because they didn't speak English. Anyway, remember in Stoic ethics, the most important thing is virtue. Stoic ethics are a type of virtue ethics. In other words... The most important thing in life, to lead a good life, to lead a happy and fulfilling life, is virtue. Without virtue, without doing the right thing, and you can think of the cardinal virtues, practical wisdom, courage, justice, temperance. By practicing those things, you are being virtuous, making the right decisions, being courageous, not just in battle, but in everyday life decisions, speaking up when you should speak up these kinds of things that's courageous to be just do the right thing as it comes to justice right do 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 just things and finally temperance don't do too much of something but also don't do too little of some things that you should be doing quite a lot of right like for example it would not be wise to say well don't don't be courageous no i mean that, that that's not temperance that's that's folly because then you're not courageous enough right it was very difficult nobody says it was easy but that's what, what, what virtue means. Do the right thing, even if it's hard. And then, and then opposite those things are the vices. And for every virtue, there's, there's an accompanying vice, right? A concomitant vice. For, for, for wisdom, there is folly. And for, for temperance, there is gluttony. And, and for, uh, um, for, for justice, there is injustice. And for courage, there is cowardice. And the idea here is... Those are things you should avoid, obviously. You should not be a coward, but you should be courageous. You should not be gluttonous. You should be temperate. You should do all these things. And then in between, the Stoics have the, the wonderful system of the indifference, with a T at the, at the end, the indifference. And indifference are things that are indifferent to virtue. To think of something like money. Money is neither good nor bad. It depends on how you use it. Now, given that people, all else being equal, would rather have money than not have money, that is considered a preferred indifferent. There are other things, like for example sickness, all else being equal, you would rather not be sick than be sick, so sickness is a dispreferred indifferent, something that you would rather not have, but if it does happen, then it happens, and you can still be virtuous, you can still do the right thing, that's why it is an indifferent. Same thing with money. If you use money in a bad way for non-virtuous things, well then it, is, then it becomes dispreferred indifferent, then it's a bad thing, right? Okay. Is that right? Does it become a dispreferred and different? No, I think that it just becomes a viceful thing. That's not. It's, it's still an indifferent, but it becomes a viceful thing because you are abusing that money. Okay, so Seneca describes, I think, this kind of virtue ethics in this part of his letter, and I find that very interesting because he, he makes the case of when something is virtuous, it's always virtuous. It can't be that one thing is virtuous, and then there is a shade of, but this is even more virtuous. No, it is good, and then it's virtuous. It's wise, and then it's virtuous. Or it's folly. And if it is folly, well, then it is, then it is viceful, and you should not do that thing, right? I think it's, very, it's an interesting way to look at things. And the, the, the Stoics, there is a famous um, analogy, uh, sort of like a... Um, is it a metaphor? I think it is a... Huh. Yeah, let's say analogy. The Stoics, one of the Stoics said, look, it's like drowning. You can drown in and have a foot of water above you. You can also drown and have a whole fathom of water above you. But it doesn't matter because in both cases you drown. So a bad act, something that is bad, that is not virtuous, that is viceful, is always bad. It doesn't matter how bad it is. Now, you could argue that. You could say, well, you know, 
if I cut someone off in traffic, that's not a good thing, but that's a different thing from me going on the street and beating someone to death. Obviously, yeah, yeah, okay, I, I, I get that point. And I certainly think you could you could debate these these kinds of things, but try to see it from the perspective of a Stoic who says, yeah, but you should try to do the right thing all the time. And doing the right thing all the time also means not cutting off someone in traffic, not uh, cutting into line, not like all the small things matter as well. They're also bad things. So it doesn't matter. This is the point of like, it could be a foot of water, it could be a fathom of water, it doesn't matter. You drown. In both cases, you drown. In both cases, you're doing the wrong thing. And conversely, a good deed is a good deed. doesn't matter if it's like saving a child from drowning, which is fantastic, everybody happy, or just returning a $10 bill to wherever you, you know, a supermarket, look, I found this, I don't know who, you know, that's also a good deed. But in both cases, you're doing the right thing, and that's what matters. Do the right thing, whether it's big or small, and don't do the bad thing, even though it's big or small. You shouldn't be doing it, and you should be doing it, right? You should not be doing the bad stuff, but you should be doing the good stuff. And I find it a very interesting way to, to think of life, and, and it could certainly become very black and white, but that's where the indifference come in. Then you have indifference that are kind of in between these two things. So the Stoics are not as black and white as they sometimes are made to seem, I find. And he, I love this, he extends it to death, right? Like all death is the same. Some deaths may be more unpleasant than other deaths, but at the end of the day, to quote David Thewlis, an actor that I, I, I really like from Kingdom of Heaven, which was a movie that I think many people really hated, I thought it was quite entertaining. I liked it. Anyway, he is, uh, I think Orlando Bloom tells David Thewlis' character in the movie, you're, you, you're riding to a certain death. And David Thewlis' character answers, all death is certain. Beautiful line. Because it's true. It doesn't, like, you, you can't be a little dead. Like, you're dead, right? And Seneca is getting to that in, I think, a very, his very eloquent and almost poetic way. It's all the same. Like, when you're dead, you're dead. So, there you go. If you do something that's good, it's good. If you do something that's bad, it's bad. And when you're dead, you're dead. What a fantastic conclusion, a brilliant, deeply profound conclusion based on this letter. But I do think it's a very interesting letter. So, I hope this was useful. Let me know what you think about this whole virtue system and such. And um, I'll be back next week for more talk about stoicism. Maybe the next one should be ASMR stoicism. Anyway, see you next time.